Hey, what's up everyone? Jukum here with a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon White 2 with fire types only. Fire types tend to be rare compared to water and grass types, yet White 2 houses many ones with unique traits and purposes. This challenge quite literally means war because remember that in a Nuzlocke, if a Pokemon faints, it's considered dead and can no longer be used. And I can only catch one of each unique fire type evolutionary line within the Unova region. The hardcore rules of this run can also be seen on screen right now. Reading up on these restrictions, the odds are stacked against us, especially since this run will be played on challenge mode. The stats of enemy trainers may remain the same, but many important fights will have revamped teams. To balance out this stat oversight by Game Freak, each level cap will be based on normal mode. Before we begin though, if you are a fan of challenge runs like these, please do consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. It helps the channel grow and motivates me to create more content for y'all's enjoyment. I've also begun streaming again. A link to my Twitch is in the description if live attempts for Nuzlocke's interest you. And finally, for the question of the day, what's your favorite fire type Pokemon? Mine's gotta be Cinderace, a very cool Pokemon from a recent gen. Wait up, uh, Sword and Shield were five years ago? <laughs> now, will my campaign fall with these extremes? Let's not burn ourselves out as our journey begins in Aspersia City. After being let off from my job, I am kicked out of the house by my mom. She doesn't seem to understand that it's literally life or death inside the war zone that is Waffle House. Can I please get a waffle? Burning with rage, my new life goal is to set Unova ablaze as champion with the power of fire types. Professor Juniper's assistant, Corporal Bianca, is quite joyous at my resolve and is willing to part ways with one of her trustworthy men, a tipping. This uncooked yet also burnt breakfast item, possibly found at a Waffle House, is going to lead the charge. I salute to you, Captain Magma. Anyway, my bestie Spongebob appears. While he's gone down the path of 7.8 out of 10, our first two battles are no more than tests compared to what's up ahead. Challenge Mode's initial blockade goes by Charon, who possesses three early game normal types. We're outnumbered, with our ranks filled up by just a captain for now. He has the capabilities to survive this onslaught though. We simply need a lot of luck. Except in attempt one, the captain gained a bit too much experience and went above the level cap. Talk about suffering from success. Then in attempt two, we straight up lose our first match against Spongebob. It isn't until attempt 3 when we successfully make it to Charon. As our match with him starts up, it'll be his Patrat we're staring down first. The main tools to hang on here will be two things. One, Defense Curl bolstering the captain's physical defense. And two, our held Orenberry for healing. You got that, Private? With the right amount of luck, the captain can slowly but surely tank the opposing Pokemon's attacks. The only problems are crits ignoring our buff defense and the fact Patrat here is also raising his attack stat via workup. This at least means he isn't striking the captain yet. When we're both at plus six for our respective stats, it's about time for this little piggy to go ham or go home. And then Patrat crits us right away, dooming our plans of victory without even letting us have a ray of hope. This is not a surprising outcome, just one that I will have to throw my face at over and over until the odds go in my favor. And boy, that do be a grand amount of times when the captain's luck is quite putrid. It's always this darn Patrat too. Like, at least crit me with Lillipup or Padove. When it comes to the title of captain, the role of leader has been passed down through the late captain's lineage, looking more and more grim with each fallen loved one. Until, on attempt 6 where a Miss Captain lined up to do battle with Charon. I am witnessing a prodigy at work. While young, the Miss Captain has total control over the battlefield. With Charon's potion used up on the defeated Patrat, the feral Lillipup is second up. And while he too cannot deliver a critical hit upon us, his Orenberry means that won't really matter. Having used work up, his tackles begin to strike us for decent damage. Along with being faster, our 6 HP Miss Captain has surely met her match. Until... A chance burn from our ember is inflicted. At red HP, Lillipup succumbs to his wounds, leaving Charon's Padov for last. The Mist Captain can outspeed this bird, whose blaze boosted ember deals exactly half his health. Padov simply sets up a workup, which is scary because he does possess a priority quick attack. But it should be okay. Padov moves second again for a supposed second workup, allowing our ember to barely miss out on the knockout. With Padov setting up another workup, we're in a pretty awkward position. All I can do is attack and hope that Padov's quick attack isn't strong enough or he gets greedy with a third workup. No matter what happens, this is the final turn of the fight. Padov does choose quick attack, and the Miss Captain hangs on with 2 HP. A complete upset by our generational Tepig, Charon's three Pokemon have crisped away, earning us our first gym badge. 
Attempt 6 is the run, as they say, and the Mist Captain can finally recruit a new soldier to her ranks, Zuko the Growlithe reporting for duty. Sadly, no Intimidate, yet that won't stop us from conquering the second gym leader Roxy's poison types. Though, um, aren't poisons a war crime? Roxy is rocking an extra Pokemon like Charon, beginning with coughing while my lead is the Mist Captain who has evolved into Pig Knight. This fight has both of our Pokemon trading off fire attacks and Veno shocks. I take notice that coughing's Orin Berry healing will let her survive this upcoming flame charge, putting us low on HP from a third Venoshock. The benefit to this is that we are at least in Blaze range, strengthening these next two flame charges enough to two-shot coughing after Roxy's Super Potion. The upcoming Grimer is also downed by two flame charges with minor damage taken from Venoshock. I'm lucky we've yet to be struck by a crit. These Sludge Beasts can never be Charon's Patrat, and I'm thankful for it. Whirlpeed is left for last, and the Mist Captain is surprisingly unable to knock her out with one Blaze Flame Charge. Zuko is taking the flame wheel from here. His calm nature is his source of firebending and durability against Venoshocks. However, it's also a detriment in that our physical attacking flame wheel is barely not a two-shot on Whirlipede. With a second Venoshock leaving us very low, we have no other choice except to click flame wheel again. We can still win with the Miss Captain, just sadly at the cost of Zuko's life. We didn't have you for long, Prince, but your aid in this effort deserves a Medal of Honor. Your pure heart during these trying times was infectious, and... Okay, kickbutt doggo lord. Surprise, surprise! It is I who shall crit in a gym battle today! That breakthrough earns us our second gym badge from Roxy. We're open to blaze a path across this blood red sea to Castelia City. This place has many useful items to collect, like two whole charcoals to buff our fire attacks. Good for this challenge, but it must be confusing in a normal playthrough, because why would you need two in the same area with a diverse team? In fact, the Miracle Seed and Mystic Water are obtainable soon too. What is this girl's purpose, if not as an excuse to spy on little old me? Makes my blood boil. Or maybe that's caused by being near the new team members we catch. Johnny the Darumaka storms into our platoon, while Natsu the Eevee will have to wait in the PC until we obtain a Firestone to evolve him. No, the Relic Passage's Dust Clouds don't contain evolution stones, or gems for that matter. They only have shards for the various move tutors in the game, which I obviously will use repeatedly. Anyway, it's a quick trip from the sewers where Team Plasma's cold-hearted war tactics were brewing to Castelia Gym for a duel with Bird's Bugs. This heated match goes about how you expect it would. Outside Dwebble, who could gain an underdog victory with several rock blast hits, which he doesn't, the rest of Bird's soldiers seem like ants in comparison to the Miss Captain's charcoal-boosted flame charges. Wiped out, Berg rewards us with our third gym badge. Up next is Elisa, a star brighter and more stunning than any flash grenade. We'll have to prep heavily for her stacked team of electric types. Within the desert resort, we discover a hidden firestone for one of my Pokemon to evolve with. This isn't our last stop though. Join Avenue is an area of interest for us. For those who haven't really messed with this place, Join Avenue is a personal shopping center handed off from a businessman to a child to manage. By inviting passerbys, they're able to open up shop. These shops differ depending on the person, and I have my eyes set on an antique shop. With with Jane here selling dubious unidentified items, we can at random obtain more Firestones before our match with Elisa. This chance to find what we're looking for grows as the shop levels up, done by recommending said shop to other passerbys. Like real customer service, the NPCs you meet here expect you to read their minds. You want to go there? Where is there? I don't know where there is. Why are you saying I do? Oh, and of course she didn't like where I recommended. Who woulda thunk, Asanta? Maybe use your big girl words, Asanta! And of course, after becoming Professor X for these fools, they barely give you points. Thanks for the tip, cheapskate! I kid you not, I did not get this on recording, but I, I kid you not, I had someone say, take me somewhere, anywhere, they then, you guessed it, disliked where I recommended. What is your definition of anywhere? Well... I'm going. My girl Jane at her go to museum Jane shop did eventually gotcha roll me a Firestone. I'll need one more of these in the immediate future. So now that I've proven you can obtain Firestones through the purgatory of changing the date over and over to renew passerbys, I'm gonna use my special DS to just plug another one in. Okay? Okay. Also, for those curious, I got over 50 Heartstones in my inventory from failed shopping ventures. I'm tempted to pelt a Sunta with them. Moving along, Natsu passes our scouting and joins us as a Flareon. Then we head into Lost Lorn Forest to find a Panseer in the rustling grass. 
This is Firestorm, and he's evolving into Semi-Seer straight away. I also evolved Prince Zuko into the beautiful Fire Lord he was always meant to be. Almost everyone achieving their final stages is fantastic for our upcoming gym battle. There will be some risk with Paralysis and her stomp flinching Speedy Zebstrika. Elisa begins with Imalga while I go with Firestorm. Despite Firestorm's modest nature, his Flame Burst deals a little less than half the Flying Rat's health, who starts Elisa's 2 IQ plan of spamming the Volt Switch button, bringing forth Flaffy in her place. That's alright, because with a Ground Gem, found in the Desert Resort, our dig strikes Flaffy for the one-hit KO, avoiding static in the process. Amalga is brought back out. Two Flame Bursts always had a chance of KOing Amalga, but the damage rolls are not in my favor as she hangs on. Luckily, her Held Citrus Berry activates, getting Amalga out of healing range and ready to be picked off the next time she's back in, since she obviously Volt Switches again. This time, it's the Fire Prone Joltik. Not the best play, Elisa. The teeny tiny spider is burnt down to cinders by flame burst, as is Amalga upon her second reappearance. Last is the aforementioned Zeb Stryka. She set her eyes on Firestorm with Volt Switch, granting us a safe swap over to the special defensive Natsu. Along with the minimum damage, leftovers help out and ensure Zeb Stryka's stomp can never kill us on a crit. That's for the best, due to Zeb Stryka landing exactly that to place Firestorm pretty low. The flinch doesn't occur though, meaning his dig hits like a truck the following turn. Again, Zeb Striker's Citrus Berry raises her HP out of any potion nonsense, so I can now swap to Zuko to absorb the stomp. And with Zuko's less high special defense, Zeb Striker goes back to using Volt Switch. A move with a zero flinch chance is a guaranteed win for us, even with the second crit, good lord Zeb Striker, Zuko's dig finishes off the lightning fast zebra. We've stolen Elisa's thunder, winning us badge number four. Our regional trek advances toward Driftvale City. Dirtied up from crossing the bridge that looks like a Charizard in the region with no Charizard, the only way to clean up is if we get washed by Clay's ground types. These fire types have stepped into the wrong turf, and while we haven't lost a soldier yet, the Mist Captain is worried about this new wall, and I am with her. Clay's super effective attacks and bulky Pokemon, including a sturdy Onix, seem insurmountable. Nonetheless, I refuse for us to march to our deaths. We have access to type boosting gems, mined in Chartstone Cave. Guess you could say this fight is mine. Clay's lead Pokemon is his intimidating Krokorok, while mine is Zuko. At the brink of death, I know, an excellent strategy in war, Zuko's martial arts skills are put to the test with a super effective 200 base power reversal. The attack drop was a fruitless endeavor, with Krokorok down for the count. Then comes Onyx Second, who I wasn't expecting, but should have, considering the AI would obviously view Explosion as the strongest option when deciding who to send out next. This already stressful match suddenly became more stressful, though not entirely out of our favor. The Mist Captain was able to take up the front on a rock slide coming in, weakened by our Eviolite. Onyx sees the Mist Captain as slower, prompting the Reptilian Rock to continue rock slides instead of super effective bulldozes. Dodging the flinch, the Mist Captain utilizes her low kick technique, passed down through the Drift Veil Tutor bloodline, placing Onyx within red health. As Clay uses a med kit on his soldier, we take advantage of this free turn by using Flame Charge. The damage is small, but notable, as is the speed boost provided by the attack. Now moving first, we prevent additional damage from Onyx by KOing him with the follow-up low kick. Third out is Sand Slash, and since I befuddled the order Clay would send out his Pokemon, this is looking rough. I first switch out the Mist Captain, going into Firestorm. He takes a ludicrous amount of damage from Bulldoze, lowering his speed. I've come to accept that sacrificing a Pokemon will be essential to stay in this fight. Unfortunately, this mission is assigned to Natsu. As much as I love this fluffy fox cat thingamabob, he's the best teammate here to get damage off on Sand Slash. Rock Slide doesn't land a crit, allowing Natsu to hang on and get off a nick of damage from a priority quick attack. Sadly, that's all the damage he'll deal in this fight, as Sand Slash puts him 6 feet under. Natsu will be missed. Friendship can conquer any threat, so once Firestorm pops back in, he's no longer slowed down from the prior bulldoze and strikes with his devastating Fire Gem boosted Flame Burst, easily securing the KO thanks to Natsu's quick attack damage. Will we need two separate grades for Ronald and Martin? Okay, as much as it hurts, deaths such as these were expected to be clay. Even if I didn't make that mistake, I am unsure if Firestorm would have been capable of defeating Excadrill, so his sacrifice was likely fated to be. Still sucks he couldn't have gotten a knockout before that, but Zuko has the determination to avenge both of his allies with a reversal. And cause Excadrill is slower and weak the reversal, the one shot on him can also come through. This wins us our fifth gym badge at a cruel cost. 
Both of our fallen comrades should have had shining futures that sparked brighter than any flame. But with their cold, lifeless corpses laid out in front of us, I ponder if this journey will require more selfish sacrifices. The Mist Captain is guilt-ridden, having ran away to save her own hide, causing the demise of Natsu and Firestorm. We worked together on this strategy and totally botched it. <sighs> There's no use dwelling on it. We can't change the past. We can only learn from our mistakes. Following one of the most one-sided tournaments ever conceived and engaging in a conflict with Team Plasma Grunts on their admittedly impressive vessel, we enlist a promising fellow, a Volcarona. Found through a cavern near the PWT, Jonathan Joestar is a great addition. Welcome to the team, may the dynamic John duo bless this run. That said, Volcarona's level up moveset ain't the best at these early levels. You know it's a situation of all time when I'm reteaching Ember to him for consistent fire damage. Also on the mid side for now is Ace the Litwick. His evolution all the way to Chandelure will have to wait until we defeat the Sky High 6 Gym Leader. Skyla is known for her death contraptions, or gym puzzles as many tend to call them. First a cannon aimed at a wall, and now wind generators potent enough to launch someone across a building. This esteemed pilot knows no bounds with her mischievous machinations, so I do not feel sorry in the slightest to mop the floor with her. After being useless into Elisa and Clay, Johnny the now Darmanitan is a lot faster and stronger, packing sheer force enhanced attacks and work up for raising his stats beyond the realm of mortality. It's therapeutic really, even with Skyla Swoobat possessing unaware to ignore work up boosts, one fire punch is all that's required to put her down. Swana is brought down by a normal gem boosted return Turn, while Sigilith is obliterated by Flare Blitz. With Johnny greatly damaged, the sturdy Skarmory is defeated by a couple of Zuko's Flame Bursts. Easy as can be, we've gained our 6th Gym Badge from Skyla. As a secondary reward from her, Skyla flies me and my squad to Lentimus Town to make our way to the 7th Gym. There's a lot before tackling Drayden's Dragons. First, the outside of Reversal Mountain is where we can find a camera, who in itself is slow and frail, but the ground typing should come in handy. However, reviewing my intel, I'm told this guy knows Rock Slide and Earth Power at this level. Attempting to catch her could cause havoc to the squad. And so... Oh, did you think I'd give up on the ground type partner? Nah, <laughs> this is the best use of my Master Ball. My Mai, say hello to Mai. Upon learning the lore that Darkrai is down to murk children for the bit, I discovered that this strange house is home to the Dusk Stone needed to evolve Ace all the way into Chandelure, Shadow Ball TM included. And with this newfound literal firepower matched with a timid nature and 31 speed IVs, Ace is incredible at outpacing Pokemon who are somewhat bulky and disintegrating them in their entirety. Like with Reversal Mountain's trainers when we are forced to team up with Corporal Bianca, or all the Spongebob's Pokemon in our fight in Undella Town. Except, uh, something I noticed with his Samra is that Aqua Jet dealt more damage than the information on this custom damage calc showed. A crit would have killed him when this in-depth trainer information said otherwise. Ace chose to take a hit, which I thought would have been his greatest feat thus far, to safely solo our rival I mean, we instead were in a more dangerous situation than predicted. With the calc not being entirely accurate, I'll have to play more carefully when prepping for fights so that I don't lose the false information. That one though... That is on me. In the battle against Zinzolan and a grunt in Lakunoso Town, I overestimated the power of sheer force fire punches and underestimated Golbat's bulk. I'm really good at losing my best Pokemon in most of my Nuzlocks, I must say. <laughs> in my defense, kinda, not really, this idiot Spongebob went for a useless Encore on the Golbat before he even performed any moves. It gets even worse for us here, Team Plasma is locked onto my side at all times, critting me with Cryogonal Slash, getting crit for the third time this battle, lovely. We cling to life as we're continuously battered and survive long enough to attain victory. The run did not prematurely end, but Johnny's loss will never be forgotten. That's one less John around, and now we're back to only five team members. Under normal circumstances, there is only one fire type left in White 2 we can use, Vulpix. It's available at the end of the game, so it'll be quite a ways away. Normally, Pokemon Black 2 and White 2 have another hidden fire type we can utilize, achieved through the use of a handy dandy app on the 3DS, the Pokemon Dream Radar. This connective side game involves helping out Professor Burnett from Sun to Moon, cool origins for this character, not gonna lie, letting us find and catch Pokemon. I wasn't saving up all these play coins for nothing. More Pokemon appear as you continue to encounter Therian forms of the forces of nature that Professor Burnett is seeking. So after fending off my sleep paralysis demon, we unlock the final restraints keeping us from obtaining a Rotom. 
Bomb. Not a fire type in itself, but on Route 9 is the Shopping Mall 9. The lower floor storage is filled with tons of junk, including a microwave that a Rota may enter to become its heat form, gaining the fire typing. Now to answer a potential question some of you might be asking, if this challenge is played on my special 3DS and the Dream Radar and Transfer is on my normal 3DS, how do I obtain my Rotom with the proper nature and IVs? Well, by leveling Rotom all the way up to 100 without giving it any EVs, it will be easy to calculate what each IV is for its stats. To do this, I put that sucker in foster care and crafted a doohickey to earn EXP for a few days, which is hopefully enough time to cope with Johnny's death. Rotom is at level 100 and I am math out of my gourd because you need a proper education in this army, leading to me plopping Blaze into my special 3DS. It's a new recruit and a way to heat up rations. And speaking of stats, this is also a good time to mention that the EVs my Pokemon have acquired may change from fight to fight. Route 5 has a benefactor of ours selling EV reducement berries for any stat-altering situations. Last for preparations, I grind for BP in the Battle Subway. Our evolved Pokemon and improved movesets make fights here less worrying. Sure, Subway trainers mainly have unevolved Pokemon, but they're EV trained and have really good held items. Following a streak of 7 to earn 3 BP, I wimp out on continuing it so I don't fight stronger foes starting over. I do this repeatedly until I have enough BP to obtain certain TMs like Protect and items like Extra Air Balloons, though there's no way I'm buying a million Focus Sashes. That'd be lame. We have stakes here, baby! Speaking of stakes, let's not get cooked by Drayden. He starts off with Drudagon as I lead with Mai. I'm basically just hoping Drudagon isn't weird here with Dragon Tail. And graciously, he goes for standard damage with Crunch after we yawn him. A Protect the next turn forces the Lego Dragon asleep. I then set off an Earthquake enhanced by our Ground Gem to deal immense damage. And because Mai is faster, she can Earthquake one more time to pick off Drudagon. Second up is Flygon. Despite having Dragon Tail, I wish to find logic with the AI. So I try to bait an Earth Power and switch to Ace holding an Air Balloon. Unfortunately, Drayden doesn't care about the obvious kill and Dragon Tails, impelling us back to Mai. Of course, I can't switch again with Ace's Air Balloon popped, who could have two-shot Flygon and survived a Crunch or Rock Slide. The only option for us now is to click Yawn and pray Flygon uses Dragon Tail. I hate everything about what just happened because it was totally out of my control despite my best intentions. It's our fourth death, yet this is the first time I felt this way. The goal of a battle is to KO the opponent's Pokemon, but Drayden's just doing stupid, 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 stupid stuff, stuff, which led to this awful situation. Vengeance is on my mind, and the same goes for the disheartened Miss Captain. She toughs out the Earth Power that would have ended her life on a crit, and then smites Flygon with Hammer Arm, which thankfully didn't miss. I protect the regain HP through leftovers to make sure we aren't in range to a Rock Slide. With that, Jonathan is sent in and survives Earth Power, allowing him to secure the KO with a Bug Gem boosted Signal Beam. Third up is Altaria. I try to whittle down his HP via a Will-O-Wisp, though it misses. Dragon Pulse and Fire Blast aren't too immediately threatening, and Altaria uses Cotton Guard anyway. Luckily, Will-O-Wisp successfully lands its mark the following turn, so as Altaria fails to hit us with Sing and strikes us multiple times with Dragon Pulse, plus our protecting turns and signal beams, I get into a position where Altaria is close to fainting and switch to Zuko on a missed Sing. Thank goodness for that, because Zuko is perfectly set up to end this match. His extreme speed picks off Altaria, while Drayden's deadly Haxorus is outsped and brought to his knees with one Dragon Gem boosted Dragon Pulse. Drayden's crazed plan of attack was stopped, letting us receive our 7th Gym Badge. Dread is in the air as we are brought down to a team less than 6 again. Oh, and Team Plasma's war on Unova. Listen, ignoring my own war on this region to become champion for a sec, I at least am not committing atrocities such as these. It's just by chance that everyone went inside before Team Plasma's artillery froze over Opelucid City. Despite my feelings toward this region, there is a greater enemy at large, so perhaps saving Unova is for the best for now. Instead of focusing on that though, I have to prove my worth one last time against our deadliest menace yet, the water-type dude bro gym leader of Humilao City. We're pulling out the mouse katools for this one, one, Marlin leads with his Waylord as I send out Jonathan. This is going to be a classic PP stall attempt, though the way we're doing it is unique to say the least. First, we set up a sunny day, weakening Waylord Scald, preventing freezes from Ice Beam, and signaling Waylord to waste a turn using Rain Dance. We've used PP ups on Sunny Day to guarantee that we'll have weather control. To deal with Waylord's Earthquake, we're packing the Magnet Rise tech learned from a Move Tutor. Yes, Volcarona, the giant moth who already flies with its wings, Magnet. worms Magnet Rise, and it's a cunning strategy for this particular fight. Protect and Leftovers also aid in healing. Roost is even better at doing
doing this while allowing me to alternate between the two. That means we have literally zero attacks on this Volcarona. This thing's purpose is to stall this thing out entirely. It takes quite a while, but the benefits for stalling out Wailord Scald and Rain Dance PP are quite handsome. Blaze enters for their debut, summoning a substitute that fails to fade away from one hit of Ice Beam. After having stalled this man for numerous turns, attacking with Electro Ball finally brings Marlin out to say, You're really into this, huh? I sure am, my dude, my bro, my hapless witness to Wailord's demise. With a second substitute intact, Marlin sends in Caracosta second. This is a surprise. I figured it'd be Mantine due to the team order listing him before Caracosta, as they shared the same strongest move in the scenario in Scald. I'm still admittedly unsure about what decides which Pokemon comes out beyond what move is strongest. I guess it makes sense Marlin would go with the non 4 times Electric Week Pokemon first. This is still manageable. This substitute was meant to defeat Mantine, so it does suck to see it go to waste as we Volt Switch to Break Sturdy. This lets us swap over to the Miss Captain, our queen for dealing with the consequences of our actions. She is holding a Pasho Berry coveted off a Wild Pansier to weaken the power of Caracosta Scald. We then knock Caracosta out with a mighty superpower. Mantine is third up, and we're still in a position to beat him. Even with our attack lowered from superpower, the Miss Captain's prepared Thunder Punch delivers a savage, four times super effective strike to Mantine's poor physical defense for the Oko. We love to learn from our mistakes and know the crit didn't matter. Last is Jellicent, who was always the one Pokemon we'd have to be risky with. The Miss Captain aids the team with a sunny day to weaken water attacks. Jellicent Scald still could kill our leader, yet the Miss Captain remains kicking to see this battle through. She switches out into our Fire Lord on a Scald. He bites Jellicent to weaken him slightly, resulting in a flinch that halts Marlin's chance to potentially crit kill Zuko. Luck is a crucial part of war too. Let's gamble once again in this fight by switching to our ace, Ace. He comes in on a recover. The remaining sun and a held Kasi Berry from the flower shop on Joint Avenue allow Ace to tank a Scald and Shadow Ball respectively for our own two Shadow Balls to connect. Except our Ace in the hole decides to land a critical hitting attack to quicken things up. Guess this is quite awkward for Marlin. He is defeated, losing to our fire types and rewarding us with our final gym badge of the Unova region. We are ready to save this region from Team Plasma. None of these grunts and whatnot hold a candle to what I've endured in the past, even Zinzolin. With Protect, I force SpongeBob to feel the pressure of having to carry the multi-battle with a useless teammate. After that, Colress, a man of mystery that I had met a few times before, is revealed to be the leader of the revived villainous team. He's a fan of mainly Steel types, a foolish choice against my fiery brigade. Blaze is in charge of breaking his lead Magneton sturdy with Overheat, holding a Cherry Berry to negate his Thunder Wave, and then Volt Switching on his Healing Turn. Ace can then safely drop in and fry and jump scare Colrus's entire team with flame bursts and shadow balls. This warfare do be unconventional because Ace is a one-man army. Magnazone's Thunder Wave is also negated by a Cherry Berry, meaning this match is one completely damageless. That just leaves the hidden boss behind the scenes, pulling the strings, or veins really, of this undead team of deplorable people. His war isn't simply on Unova, but the entire world. His ambitions are grander than mine, I'll admit I was petty, though not unfounded. Getsus is plain evil when it's all said, forfeiting the free wills of everyone else, including a hero of destiny and his partner. We must win! To free Getsus' captive legendary Kyurem, the Mist Captain personally strikes him down with a superpower. It's a very quick finish, separating Kyurem and the hero's Reshiram. This is the beginning of the end for Getsus' schemes. He demands a match with our squad himself. Gets it starts off with Kafa Grigas while the Miss Captain is automatically my lead from before. She's returned right away for Ace to come in, who becomes toxic by Kafa Grigas. With toxic damage racking up from Kafa Grigas stalling with Protect, Ace has to deal damage fast and hard. His Shadow Ball decimates the esophagus in one go. Then comes a four times Grass Week this victim, which is why we're equipped with Energy Ball. The Oko goes without saying, as does the fact that we need to immediately switch out to Blaze on Getsus' Drapion. His Night Slash thankfully doesn't crit, would have been nasty with Drapion's sniper ability, making them do triple damage. We outmaneuver the sniper's tricks by protecting for Leftover's recovery, alongside a Volt Switch into the Mist Captain on another Night Slash. She's been maintaining an image for her soldiers to feel inspired, and she intends to keep it that way by KOing Drapion with a superpower. Electros is out fourth, who I let Blaze initially handle. Acrobatics isn't a problem for them, but a crunch defense drop is. 
This doesn't occur the first time we fire off a Shadow Ball, and it does the second time. That's alright. Blaze Volt switches into Jonathan to defend against the Crunch, who ends Electros with his Signal Beam. Getsus intends to prey upon Ace's four times rock weakness with his Hydreigon's Rock Slide. Not a very well thought out strat, because you left yourself wide open to the super effective Signal Beam that blasts Hydreigon into submission. Last is Toxicroak. He sure is anticipating something alright. This four times super effective Psychic barrages the frog until he's down and out. We've won against Getsus, Mastermind of Team Plasma, and saved the Unifa region, all for me to be petty. <laughs> Heading toward the Pokemon League, we're finally able to obtain the TM for Flamethrower. I want to mention that this entire time, Ace's primary fire type attack was Flame Burst. That already hit like a truck, so this upgrade is just what we need to turn him into a weapon of mass destruction. As for the victory road ahead, several scary trainers are housed within it. Many of these jerks happen to have the toughest Pokemon for our fire types to deal with. An example being these two veterans with both Unovan Fossils and late game Blooming Birds for the Wild Charge CM. It was not worth risking it against them. Sorry Zuko, no Wild Charge for you. This brings us to our final rival fight with SpongeBob. This is a two soldier job. Blaze shakes off Swagger Confusion with a Persian Berry and Volt switches for immense damage. Ace can secure the KO afterward with Flamethrower. Buffalon gets duped by swapping between Blaze and Ace, who are immune to Earthquake and Head Charge respectively. Enough Volt switches whittle the Wild Buffalo into range for Ace's Flamethrower to knock him out. And with Spongebob Samurott not possessing Aqua Jet this time, a Grass Gem Energy Ball KOs him while Flamethrower reduces Simi Sage to dust. Nothing is left between us and challenging the Pokemon League. Before the gauntlet begins, I mentioned way back about Vulpix. They are found in the Abundant Shrine, only accessible with Waterfall. Ignoring the stupidest trainer that could possibly be blocking our path, we recruit our last teammate, Flame Princess. We call her FP for short. With that and other preparations settled, these six Pokemon are the only ones remaining within this platoon. Young and old, their minds can be easily read. They want to win this war and become champions. This is a mission we can't afford to fail. So let's begin and head out to the field. Kaylin is who we're matched against first, and she might as well have stayed curled up in her sheets because after slightly damaging her lead Mushard with Blaze's facade, she puts them to sleep with Hypnosis. This lets Ace come in for free on the Beta Dream Eater and mow through Kaylin's psychics with spell tag enhanced Shadow Balls, outside a very flamethrowable Metagross. Everyone on her team is groggy, unable to outspeed Ace, placing victory in our hands for the first battle of the Pokemon League with Kaylin's defeat. Second up is the gambling addict Grimsley and his dark types, who we're funnily gambling a bit against. As for his Liperd lead, we're sending out the Fire Lord with 1 HP. Protect on turn 1 stops Liperd's normal gem fake out into unburdened activation, one of two whole threats in this fight. As with expert belt boosted reversals, four of Grimsley's dark types get O code even through Crocodile's Intimidate attack drop. Bisharp is his last hope, who does have an out against us. No, not Sucker Punch. Grimsley has his chest man equipped with a Quick Claw. There is a 20% chance that thing goes off, making him faster than Zuko and killing him, meaning I'm switching to Blaze on a random move. They take a Meaty Knight Slash, so I swap again to avoid a crit Quick Claw, this time into the Mist Captain on the resisted Dark Attack. With two turns of Leftovers Recovery thanks to Protect, there is technically a situation where Bishop can out-prioritize the Mist Captain with Quick Claw, land a critical hit with a super effective Aerialist, and attain the 1 in 16 damage roll to kill us. That is a 0.078125% scenario. So unlikely to happen that I just let a superpower rip. What are the odds? You know what the funniest thing is? That hit the damage roll to kill on a crit. The irony of almost losing one of my Pokemon to low odds lunacy against a gambling man who bets on Skarmory interrupting a coin toss is not lost on me. Well, whatever. We must remain cool for future fights as Grimsley of the Elite Four is outplayed. Next on our list is Chantal and her Ghosties. This battle is simple in theory, yet may prove problematic in execution. With Kofagrigus as Chantal's lead, FP's debut will be a sweep attempt. She considers violating the Geneva Conventions with a nasty plot, sharply raising her special attack. Shadow Ball is easily livable. A critical hit could ruin the sweep by putting us in range of Bayonet's Muscle Band Sucker Punch, and high rolls of this attack may make this awkward as well. With the roll seen here, we're definitely in Sucker Punch crit range, but I proceed with the sweep for now. FP's Dark Pulse, with Black Glasses enhancing the attack, blasts through Chantal's Kofagrigus, Golurk, and Driftblim. Bayonet finally comes out fourth, and I do think the odds of hitting the crit damage roll to kill are low, as well as it being more likely Chantal uses Shadow Claw instead for more damage. I am correct with that assumption 
explosion, allowing FP to knock Bayonet out too. Chantal's Ace Chandelure is her final Pokémon. This last has a Choice Scarf increasing her speed by 50%. I've mentioned before how my own Ace is fairly quick. Now imagine what it's like with a Choice Scarf. We'll have to play safely and plot out a plan of attack. Except FP already has a plan. Attack. Yes. FB came in clutch when we caught her, possessing a naive, speed-boosting nature. With speed EVs, she well outpaces Chandelure, striking with Dark Pulse, and sending her on her second trip to the Great Beyond with the rest of Chantal's team. That's the third Elite Four member defeated. Last up is Marshall and his fighters, the trickiest of the Elite Four. Marshall sends out his throw, while my lead is Ace. We attack fast with a Psychic to clear away most of Throw's health, who muddles our speed with a Bulldoze. It's not enough to make Ace go second, meaning we can easily get the KO with another Psychic the following turn. Marshall is going big with his Ace Conkeldur second. We've got a stable plan to check this Goliath. Count Elder is holding a Flame Orb to activate his Guts ability and increase his attack, but we actually want this to go off, so I protect to stay safe. Then, we spook a slower Conk with Hex, a Ghost-type attack with 50 base power in Generation 5 that doubles in strength if the target has a non-volatile status ailment applied to them, like Burn. With a Ghost Gem, the power of this move is nuts, and Oak hosts the Construction Worker without worry. Third out is Lucario. To deal with his special attacks, I swap over to FP on supposedly Shadow Ball. My heart drops seeing Carmine instead. You see, FP's purpose was to KO Lucario before laying down her life to break Sox 30. What I realized though was with a Shell Bell, FP could regain enough health from depleting Lucario's full HP bar to survive Sock's non-crit rock slide. A Fire Gem would have been ideal here to blast past the Calm Mind's special defense boost because now it'll take two attacks to beat Lucario while risking an unnecessary crit. If FP falls to Lucario and not Sock, someone else will have to break the ladder sturdy. We're risking it big time here. Don't let us down, FP. Her flamethrower hits Lucario for great damage. As for this Aura Sphere... FP avoids the critical hit! Our Princess of Flames royally messes Lucario up with one more flamethrower for the KO! We're back on track as Sock comes forth. Like I said, FP will likely have to fall here, but she is willing to lay down her life for her kingdom. We give her a semblance of a chance by breaking Sock's sturdy with extra sensory. Unfortunately, the flinch chance cannot occur and save her life. She wasn't known for long, yet her impact on this Elite Four was dazzling. Thank you so much for your help, FP. With the free switch, Jonathan enters the field of battle to psychic Sock out of this world. Last is Mean Xiao, who isn't bulky nor faster, succumbing to Jonathan's second helping of psychic powers. That's Marshall and the entire Elite Four out of the way. Before heading to the champion's room, let me discuss that fight with Marshall. I wouldn't say that was a sloppy execution. I can just never get those single mistakes that can cause huge repercussions out of my head. After meticulously charting a course for what I thought was every situation in a very hard fight, Calm Mind was the one move I forgot to factor in that could have spelled disaster. Hey, I may not be the best at everything related to Nuzlocke, I'd like to think I'm decent, but learning from these mistakes is a lot of fun, and I'm at least thankful the bad luck that may have happened didn't happen. Anyway, me and the rest of my squad have to work as one. We cannot be sidetracked on our prior mistakes in the most important match of the entire run. I approach Champion Iris, who fancies a deadly duel with her determined dragons. Throughout this journey, I've slowly set aside my qualms with the Unova region, but my Waffle House fighting instincts kicked in for the first time since the beginning. Let's see which of us will be the one flattened like a pancake. Champion Iris starts off this battle with Hydreigon, while my lead is Fire Lord Zuko. We are still lacking in HP, and you can guess for what purpose. 200 base power reversals hit different indeed as Zuko earns us the first KO of the fight, destroying Hydreigon. Second up is Agron. Iris's Agron actually lacks sturdy, utilizing moves that benefit off Rockhead. This means Zuko's reversal can combo kill two of Iris's Pokemon with Agron's defeat. Third is Lapras. Iris really seems keen on sending out all of her fighting weak Pokemon. Even with Lapras's bulk, she too cannot fathom the strength of our reversal. Out fourth is her insanely strong and fast Archeops. Not fast enough! With a held black belt covered off a wild throw, Zuko is able to chain together a fourth KO on the champion's team. I've kept a reversal on Zuko this entire time precisely for this moment. He was one lucky pup surviving the battle against Roxy way back, and he's continuing to stand strong in this final battle, defying the minus attack nature gods to single-handedly sweep four deadly threats to our squad. He is one of the goodest boys I could ever ask for, so it pains me that, to win this fight, 
Zuko is required to pass on as Iris' Haxorus has now made her a rival. This absolute unit of a dragon has a focus sash to avoid being one shot and dragon dance for raising attack and speed. She could very well wreck my entire team if not played around correctly, though she should aim for the KO on Zuko since he's at his limits. In a situation where Haxorus dragon dances, we have extreme speed priority to finish him. Using reversal, Zuko leaves Haxorus open to a secondary attack taking him out. He understands his mission is complete, but seeing Haxorus' outrage savagely bring down this Fire Lord has ignited the fire in me and my team's hearts intensely. This was ideal. Just a very sad ideal. Jonathan is brought out to finish this foe. Haxorus is stuck outraging, granting Jonathan the perfect chance to unleash a sunlight yellow overdrive onto the draconic monster. Signal Beam is a light based attack, so, you know, it fits. Iris's last Pokemon is her Drudagon, who many of our Pokemon can handle. However, the Miss Captain wishes to put her life on the line to make things right. She's willing to risk a critical hit from Iris's last stand to feel this moment in its entirety. The moment of life and death that covers every corner of the battlefield. She has had many close calls, and she's wondered if it was unfair for her to have survived after failing the many lost in this war. This is anything but stealing the glory. Because despite these missteps, and the guilt hounding her to no end, the Miss Captain's soldiers trust her no matter what. No matter what. They consider her more than just their captain. They would, with no hesitation, proudly state that she is their friend, and one worthy of the title of captain, passed down through her family line. Her ancestors, her fallen comrades, and those still among the living are all watching, time stopped in anticipation for if their loved one can survive Drodagon's vicious attack. Yes, she reciprocates everyone's feelings, toughing it out so that they may never know sadness ever again. The stage is set, this is my final command to you. Fire off the finishing blow, Miss Magma! You deserve any and all praise, my captain. Let's have some victory waffles, y'all, because my team and I have just defeated Iris and became champions in this Pokemon White 2 Nuzlocke. Well, how about that? A challenge mode run that went more in my favor than I initially thought. At least, it did after I made the mistake of losing my Darmanitan like a fool. Ignoring that, I lost five other Pokémon, and I think their sacrifices were either calculated, or at least done in a way to keep the more important Pokémon around when the AI was just being asinine. I would have loved to use certain Pokémon like Flareon and Camerupt more, but it was probably for the best that in their respective fights, they were the ones who fell. With that logic, I think I played decently well in this run. Like I said at the beginning, please consider liking the video and subscribing for more Nuzlocke and content, as well as following my Twitch to get notifications on my Nuzlocke streams. With that, see you guys next time for more Pokemon content.